Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. Hi everyone, this is Multi Hazards, a podcast where we take a deep dive into issues in emergency management, climate change adaptation, security, etc. And ultimately, it's about protection, protecting communities. I'm your host, Vin Nelson. So, season one keeps rolling out. Today is a special day. I'm thrilled to have the chance to interview Phil Gursky. Phil Gursky is the president and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting Limited and program director for the Security Economics and Technology SET Hub at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute, PDI. He worked as a Senior Strategic Analyst at CSIS, Canadian Security Intelligence Service, from 2001 to 2015, specializing in violent Islamist-inspired homegrown terrorism and radicalization. From 1983 to 2001, he was employed as a Senior Multilingual Analyst at Communications Security Establishment CSE, Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency, specializing in the Middle East. He also served as Senior Special Advisor in the National Security Directorate at Public Safety Canada from 2013, focusing on community outreach and training on radicalization to violence until his retirement from the civil service in May 2015 and as a consultant for the Ontario Provincial Police's Anti-Terrorism Section, P-A-T-S, PATS, from May to October 2015. He was the Director of Security and Intelligence at the SecDev Group from June 2018 to July 2019. Mr. Gursky has presented on violent Islamist-inspired and other forms of terrorism and radicalization across Canada and around the world. He is the author of The Threat from Within, Recognizing Al-Qaeda-Inspired Radicalization and Terrorism in the West, from Roman and Littlefield, 2015, and also Western Foreign Fighters, The Threat to Homeland and International Security from Roman and Littlefield, 2017. The Lesser Jihads, Taking the Islamist Fight to the World from Roman and Littlefield, 2017. An End to the War on Terrorism. And When Religion Kills, How Extremists Justify Violence Through Faith, Lynn Reiner, 2019. Mr. Gursky regularly blogs and podcasts on terrorism, for example, on An Intelligent Look at Terrorism, available on his website www.borealisthreatandrisk.com, and tweets on the subject at Twitter handle at Borealis Saves. He is an Associate Fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism, ICCT, in the Netherlands, a digital fellow at the Montreal Institute for Genocide Studies at Concordia University, a member of the board at the National Capital Branch of the CIC, Canadian International Council, and an affiliate of the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security, and Society, TSAS, TSAS. Mr. Gursky is a regular commentator on terrorism and radicalization for a wide variety of Canadian and international media. He is fluently trilingual in English, French, and Spanish. Now, as is our tradition here at the Multi-Hazards podcast and out of deep respect for the First Nations whose land I'm podcasting from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, I would like to say a territorial acknowledgement. I'm using the text from Kwantlen Polytechnic University or KPU, a local post-secondary school. So here we go. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded 
traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. These are the names of various First Nations groups around me here in Greater Vancouver, here on the west coast of Canada. Now, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Welcome everybody to the Multi-Hazards Podcast. We have Phil Gursky here, who's an expert in terrorism and many other things. And uh, you've heard the bio that I've already told you about. And let's just get started. So hi, Phil. You're hi. on the line. Hi, Vin. How you doing? Great. So how are you and your family surviving the COVID-19 pandemic? We're, we're doing well, thank you. One of the positives, I guess, of being semi-retired is that I don't have a job to go to, which means I don't have an office that I can't visit. So uh, to be perfectly honest, the whole COVID thing hasn't been much of a change in my life. The only real change is I don't get a chance to have coffee with people and have face-to-face conversations. But I've been pretty busy doing podcasts and blogs since COVID came out. So we're doing well, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, it'll be nice uh, when life becomes a bit more normal, but uh, who knows what that normal will look like, eh? <laughs> the new normal, that's right. We'll have to wait and see. The new normal. So I just want to backtrack a bit for our listeners and just um, uh, tell everybody how I came upon Phil. So basically, i had been thinking about doing a podcast about apocalyptic ideas, which means apocalypse i think it's a greek word it means to take the cover off of something so many groups not just religious but otherwise have a vision what the future is going to be like 100 percent, or maybe if they work hard it'll become whatever their ideal utopian future is and so i was thinking this actually affects our politics and affects a lot of groups who may get into terrorism later on so I've been, I checked out, uh, Phil Gersky's, um, website. Let me get, it's, uh, Borealis. Let's see, Borealis. What's the rest of your website uh, name? Yeah, www.borealisthreatenedrisk.com. Threatened risk. Okay. And then I heard some, uh, I heard your podcast. I think it's called Quick Hits. And you were talking about COVID-19 and religion. And I thought, whoa, that's the first time I've heard anybody mention that. And then you were mentioning how that, Perhaps there are people out there who um, may be flouting the social distancing rules from the government because they think, well, God's with me. God protects me. So, hey, I I, I don't really have to worry about COVID-19. And yeah, sure, maybe for that individual, it's okay uh, to to go out and do whatever they want. But it affects everybody else around who may not feel that God is protecting them. So it's kind of a contradiction so that's how i came upon you phil and that's why i thought hey phil would be great for the show so yeah that was a cool podcast i and i'm surprised people are really afraid to talk about religion um so i remember in school they said don't talk about anything like religion and politics with other people it could only bring up strife and conflict but here i am uh, in the middle age, and I, I love to talk about religion because I think if we talk about it in a more like curious manner, diplomatic manner, more factual manner, it, it's it's a it's a healthy topic if we just stay within boundaries. So, so uh, absolutely. And I, if yeah. I could just put in there, Vin, my my, sure. my late my late mother, God rest her soul, said to me, she said at one point in my life, she said, "Son, exactly what you just said. Son, whatever you do, don't talk about politics or religion." And I became a terrorism specialist looking at Islamist extremism. So I, I go into a career where all I do is talk about politics and religion. So mom, uh, wherever you are, I apologize. Your son didn't take your advice. But it, as you said, it's a fascinating topic and one that you have to be careful because you can insult people. But at the same time, as you just mentioned, you, you still can talk about facts and you can talk about impressions. You can talk about analysis. And I don't think shying away from it is a solution either. Right. And for a lot of people, it's a very important part of their life. And they feel very awkward, I think, to just always be hiding it. Oh, I have to be careful. I can't let anybody know about my religion or else they may be offended. So it's it's it. Yeah, there are two extremes, people wearing it on their sleeve. But then on the other hand, people feeling insecure because they have to hide it all the time. So I think we should all be a little more comfortable with religion in the public sphere. And 
So anyways, let's back up now. And I'm just wondering how you would re define religion, Phil. Wow. <laughs> what a great question. So, I mean, you know, I clearly am not a scholar of religion. My, my knowledge of religion has come really through my desire to understand better what motivates what I call religious-based terrorism. And, and, you know, just for your listeners, just to, to point out that, you know, in the Canadian Criminal Code, uh, terrorism is defined as an act of serious violence that's motivated by one of three underlying drivers. And those drivers are political, ideological, or religious. So religious is in the criminal code. Uh, so my understanding of religion is essentially it's a belief in a another power, uh, a higher power. It's a belief that there is a system of rewards for what you do well and a system of punishments for which you do not so well. And that you'll be answerable uh, for your acts when, when you die to some kind of a deity, whatever that is. And I think for a lot of people as well, religions are uh, systems in which they truly believe that there are forces out there that actually have an impact on your life on a daily basis. That, you, know, that, you know, Jesus is with you or God is with you kind of thing. And people, therefore, will often interpret actions or plan their actions based on their desire to do what they think their religion is calling them to do, what, what their maker is calling them to do. And as you said, this is a really important point. I, I'm, I'm not religious myself. At one point in life, I was a little more so. Mm -hmm. For many people, this is a very comforting thought. And this and, and there's, there's, there's so many good things that are done in the name of religion and because people believe in a higher power. So we unfortunately hear about the negative things far too often nowadays. But it's important to point out that many good deeds, and there are many good people out there, that do wonderful things for the poor, for the needy, for the dispossessed, out of a sense of religion. And there are right. many people that do things without us out of a sense of religion. So, I mean, let's not sort of label this all on, under one sort of big tent. But I, I do think that the, the negative parts do get far too much attention. And, and let's face it, you know, the old journalistic adage is, if it bleeds, it leads. So when, right. you, when do you hear about religion? Well, when, when somebody does something reportedly in the name of religion that, that ends up being bad. So I think we get a skewed version or vision of what religion is in modern society. Right, right. But yeah, as you said, there's a lot of good. And even if you look at most of the, well, I wouldn't say most, I can't take a statistical analysis here, but a lot of the charities, not only in our country, Canada, but worldwide are religious. So, and they're not all doing it just because they think, hey, we want to proselytize and this Charity work is kind of our avenue to proselytize, to convert other people. Some uh, groups are just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They believe their religion motivates them to to be kind to people and help out in time of need. Absolutely. And I, I, that's a really good point. And, yeah, some do take advantage of this. You know, they all sort of tie their efforts and aid to uh uh, doing some proselytization or some conversion and that definitely happens but you know then the bottom line is and I, i've always believed this the vast majority of people on this planet are just good decent people and they're, they're good decent people some of them because they're religious and some because they're not but i think the vast majority of people don't mean anyone else harm they don't want to hurt anyone they want to do well and they, and, and they want to help people where they where they find them so whether that that's true religion or not is it, it, you know is an, sort of a side question but let's not assume that all, you know, all humans have a nefarious intent or an evil intent behind it. They don't. Most people are just decent, run-of-the-mill, average people. Right. Now, in our context, Canada, we have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I never really appreciated it. I took a course, I think it was a year or two ago, in uh, law, emergency management law. So we had to study the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I thought... It was a big revelation. I thought, wow, here's a document for me as a Canadian citizen that really clearly spells out how I need to treat people who have another religion, ethnicity, birthplace, uh, marital status, sexual orientation, ability, gender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this, these are kind of like safe uh, limits or guidelines how we treat each other and uphold each other's human rights. So... When we talk about religion, it's for us as Canadians, that's often the framework. Um, so what do you think about that? I, I, you know, obviously, there's a reason why we have the Charter, right? The Charter has been around. I mean, it wasn't around when I was a child. It came out, you know, in the 1980s. 
mm-hmm. the fact that we that we as Canadians decided we needed a charter or wanted a charter is obviously a good thing. It spells out definitively what uh, we stand for as a nation. It stands for what rights we have embraced as a nation that all Canadians should have. I, I, I'm not going to lie to you, Vin. I think on occasion there have been some charter challenges to things that I think are rather frivolous mm-hmm. and, and, and not important. But overall, it, it essentially is, it, it, it embodies in, in, in one document, which we call the Charter, here's who we are, here's what we stand for, here's what we protect, here's what we recognize, and here's what we see as valuable. That can't be a bad thing. I mean, some of the controversies notwithstanding, it's a good thing to have, and I think that most Canadians would recognize that. Right. So, in one sense, it, it tells us how we should treat people who are religious. But on the other hand, it also tells the people who are religious and everybody else that, for example, you can't look down on on homosexuals. You can't, you know, look down on people who are of another religion and then publicly sort of slander them. So there, there's there's a fine line there. Absolutely, because you know as well as I do that in certain religions, including some versions of Christianity, uh, Islam, and perhaps Hinduism, which I'm not nearly as well versed on, you know, there are some real issues with acceptance of same-sex uh, marriages or same-sex relationships. And the fact that the Charter says you can't discriminate based on that, it really kind of puts a, a challenge out there to these people that, that says, you may very well hold, you know, your religion may teach you X, but based on the Charter, you can't use that to not deal with people or refuse to say you're a store owner to refuse to acknowledge people and that's a good thing right i mean whatever your views are on homosexuality or whatever you want to call it other sort of what we would associate as you know um i don't want to use the term normative not things that weren't considered to be normal in in the past and certainly they're considered normal by both people now the charter says you you can't use it you can't use your thoughts and your beliefs to discriminate against these people. And again, that, that's, that's a really good thing. You may hold personal views, but you cannot allow those, those views to infringe on and take away the rights of other Canadians just because you believe it to be so. Right, exactly. Now, some people, they use the word religion and they, they would say, oh, socialism is a religion. Oh, environmentalism is a religion. Uh, they really get carried away with the, the definition of religion. They're kind of stretching the boundaries. But... In Canada, where we live, a religion has to register with the government. They get tax, uh, I don't know if it's absolutely free status, but they get some tax breaks. So there's a, there's a, a, a more organized group legal uh, framework for religion. So it's, it's kind of tough when people stretch it and they say, well, you know, incels have their own religion, socialists. It, it's going a little bit too far. So. <laughs> Do you think we can stretch the definition of religion like that? Well, I, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, if you if you boil it down to, I guess, what the term means, it's a system of beliefs, right? Religion's a system in beliefs. It happens to be a system of beliefs that has to do with the the supernatural, if I can use that term, the hereafter, a force that you know is out there that's not part of the the, the human uh, normal way of doing things. And in some ways, you could say that religion is an ideology, right? It's a set of ideas. Right. And therefore, you you could say that uh, there are other types of ideologies out there. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think I'd, I'd prefer to punt that question to a religious scholar and to see if there really is a difference between religion as a phenomenon and ideology as a phenomenon. I do see that the two would overlap, but I'm not sure to what extent. So, yeah, I think the term is used rather loosely in a lot of ways. And I'd be curious to see what other people who are much better versed in this than I am how they would come down on that question. Right. Well, language is important. I remember, I thought, I think I saw on your website you were talking about terrorism, the definition, and it's, you were, I think, hinting at saying that you can't just put it for everything and anything out there that incels are terrorists or white men who get army guns and sort of shooting rampage are necessarily terrorists, but there, it actually has to have a defined ideology behind it. Well, that's my view, and, I, and I've been I've been crucified online. There's, there's, a, there's a good religious term for you, crucified online okay. for questioning that things like incels, in fact, are terrorists. I think that this is a debate. I think there is uh, some agreement and some disagreement in this regard. But 
the, the the reason that I worry about the overuse of the word terrorism, Vin, is that I look at it from a from a government and a, and a prosecutorial like I would I didn't work as a prosecutor. I didn't work for the Crown, although I did testify in some terrorism cases here in Canada. If you call something terrorism under the criminal code, you have to demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that the particular act, the particular act of violence, was perpetrated for an ideology or a political or a religious cause. If you can't demonstrate that, you you don't win your case. So. The problem with calling everything terrorism is that if you fail to establish that there's a link is there, you run a very strong uh, chance of losing your case. So in the case of, let's say, incel, and, and, and the most recent case is a, a killing in Toronto in February, where after investigation, the initial charges of a first-degree murder and attempted murder were up to first-degree murder with terrorist intent. You can prove first-degree murder fairly easily, right? You mm-hmm. can prove attempted murder. I mean, either the guy did or did not stab the, these two women. Determining why he did it, what was in his mind at the time, that's a much harder, that's a much harder thing to prove. And so if you're the crown, and we've seen this in many cases in Canada, Alexandre Bissonnette, the guy at the mosque in Quebec City in 2017, he was not charged with terrorism. He was charged with first degree murder. And in fact, he pleaded guilty. The guy that was, um, ran down a police officer in Edmonton in, in the fall of 2017 had an ISIS flag on his, on the, on his, on the seat of his van. He was not charged with terrorism. He was charged with attempted murder. So this is really a political decision to go down this road. And I just think that the concept of terrorism is being uh, widened to the point where it almost becomes meaningless. And as I've said, and, and, you know, it, when everything is terrorism, nothing is terrorism. And I think right. we have to be, we have to be really careful to use the term, both from a judicial perspective and, for, you know, from a common conversation perspective, there's obviously a lot more leeway. What you, what you and I talk about isn't going to have an impact on Canadian law. It's not going to have an mm-hmm. impact on Canadian cases. But when it comes to going to court, legal language is very precise for a reason, right? You, you, you do things very carefully because if you don't do it carefully enough, you end up losing or getting the consequences you don't want. So that was kind of my, my, my whole pushback on the, on the incel thing, plus the fact that I'm still not convinced it's an ideology, but people disagree with me, and that's fine. We can have that debate. But I, I think we have to be a little more careful when we throw the word terrorism around in those types of contexts. Right. So words matter. And it could be the, as you said, it could be what we use in conversation and we kind of debate what a word means. But then in a nation's legal setting, words have precise meanings and you can't just use it willy nilly for for everything. Right. So Absolutely not. And, then, you know, rightly or wrongly, the law is the law. And we'll, we'll see what happens in this case. Maybe they'll succeed and maybe this will become, um, you know, uh, boilerplate, um, you know, um, stuff that will happen all the time. Maybe they'll lose the case and they'll have to reconsider how they do it next time. I mean, we'll have to wait and see. Right. So just um, backing up a bit, I was thinking, now I know you're an expert in terrorism, and I was just thinking about it. To me, that's worst case scenario. This is when the the poop hits the fan. And uh, sorry, I'm trying to keep this uh, general. So I, when I register with Apple Podcasts, I can register clean on my podcast. But when the, the stuff hits the fan, terrorism is kind of worst case scenario. And then, of course, yeah, it, it, it may turn into like organized uh, groups who, who keep it going. But before the worst case scenario, there's this process that – uh, say religious people may go on that leads them toward violence. And, um, you were saying in your book, uh, it came out earlier this year, When Religion Kills. I, I noted in chapter one, there's a few characteristics you had mentioned that could lead people down the, uh, the dark road to, to, to violence. So yeah, that came right. out earlier this year, right? Yeah, that, actually, November of last year was the publication date for it's uh, from Lynn Reiner. Came out late in 2019. Yeah, what okay. you're talking about is what is is what has been termed the process of radicalization, and that's a term that gets used uh, and misused a lot. And they, you know, we, is it a pathway? Is it a process? Is it a transformation? Whatever it is, what we notice, and, and this is going back, you know, to my career working for CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Actually, my my very first book, The Threat from Within, from 2015, goes into a lot of detail about what we found out about why Canadians were embracing Islamist extremism. And the bottom line was that, you know, we, there's no profile, there's no set pathway, there's no one way to get there. And a lot of things that people put forward as reasons or uh, instigators or impetuses why people embrace terrorism proved out to be not, not all that useful. So, for example, people said, oh, it's all about poverty. Only, only, to, only poor people become terrorists. Well, that's, that's categorically false. 
lots of middle class, upper class people become terrorists. They have no financial worries or, you know, only people who are marginalized become terrorists. Well, that's categorically false as well. Lots of people who are just average citizens become terrorists. So we learned a lot about sort of what to look for in terms of the signs that somebody was embracing violent extremism without having to say, you know, here is a profile you can pin up on a wall. So your police departments and your security intelligence agencies and your society writ large can say, oh, this guy fits the profile. I'm going to call CSIS. I'm going to call the RCMP. It doesn't work that way. It really is as, as variable as the individual is. But there certainly are signs. And, and, and the, the one that I was most, uh, I guess, best at based on my career at CSIS was trying to look at Islamist extremism and what they look like. What do they say? What do they post? What do they tell their friends? What is what is it? What is their ideology like? What things do they believe in? And we found there actually were some some fairly robust characteristics about what it looked like without trying to prejudice the question as to why they went down that pathway in the first place. Because we found that was just that was useless. You you, you just you couldn't predict that in a way that you could sort of get in on the ground floor earlier. You had to wait until you started seeing some of the signs. And at that point, you can intervene, whether it's through law enforcement or some kind of counseling or whatever kind of thing. Uh, that's the, that's the sort of thing that we realized after we looked at this thing for oh, the better part of 10 or 15 years. All right. So now I know that tribalism is, is one of the kind of main things. I mean, we have it all over society. We have religions, we have ethnicities, nation groups, we have even baseball teams, wrestling fans, everybody's into their group. And then Maybe in a healthy sense, we have competitions. We have us versus them. Great. It's our football team against another football team. And, uh, of course, eventually in a lot of things, our group, our tribe needs to work with other tribes. But, um, a lot of this, a lot of the dark path, I think it starts with us versus them. And then that, that kind of, um, how do you say that thought kind of grows and grows. Now I, I, I heard your caliphate pod, uh, podcast you were talking about each um episode of the netflix series caliphate and mm-hmm. uh, i haven't heard them all yet but i've been watching because of you i've been watching caliphate and i noticed that as these young people were were watching online some of these isis videos that one of the strong themes was us versus them that we are kind of like a, a special group we're chosen by god And look at Swedish government. They're not treating our people. They're not treating Muslims properly. Look at these Western governments. They're not treating people properly. So it's this sense of victimization. So us versus them, it seems like a a big starting point for people. Oh, it's it's huge. And, you you know, it's not just the Islamic State and Islamist extremists. You're seeing the same thing with Hindu extremists in India who are othering Christians and Muslims. You see the same thing with Jewish extremists in occupied territories where they're othering Palestinians. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's tremendous. And what happens is that when you do an us versus them, that's fine. You said like we have us versus them all the time. You know, you have Habs fans versus Leafs fans, for example, in hockey. But when the, when the extremists take get a hold of it, not only are you saying that I'm better than you, you're going one step further. You're saying not only am I better than you, I don't recognize your, your uh, right to exist. The particular system that you believe in so looking at islamist extremists everyone else is a kafir which is you know their word for for infidel and not only am, am i better than you i i have the right to kill you unless you cow you kowtow to my demands embrace my religion reject your past and become one of us and like i said same thing happens with religions across the world when the extremists get a hold of it they use it to basically justify in religious terms in divine terms why it is that they are allowed to capture, torture, and kill people. And they say it's all basically, it's divinely mandated. So again, going back to Islamist extremism, which is my specialization. Oh, and just by the way, just for, for you know, mm-hmm. this is a minor point. I hate being called an expert only because experts are a dime a dozen nowadays. So I prefer the term specialist myself, but that's no big deal. Um, you know, Islamist extremists will basically say that, you know, not only can they target you and kill you, they have no right, they have no, no choice. It is divinely mandated. There's a term that they use, and it's called farb ein, which is Arabic for an individual obligation. Mm-hmm. And that obligation is given to you by God. Allah uh, obliges you to do this. And if you don't do it, you're not a true Muslim. So that's how bad it can get when people look at 
other people and say, yeah, I don't like who, I don't like you. I don't like the way you worship. I don't like the way you live. And, um, I'm going to kill you as a result. And the same when, you know, for homosexuals, we saw with the Yazidis in Iraq after mm-hmm. the Islamic State created a caliphate. These people would say, you know what? We can, so Yazidis being an ethnic group in, in sort of what we call Kurdistan, they right. would say, you know what? We, we, yeah, we have the right to kill your men, rape your women, and take your children as sex slaves. We have that right because God tells us you have to do it. That's, that's a, an extreme uh, position for any religion to, to hold. But we saw it 2014, 2015, 2016, and we have thousands of cases. I mean, they're still finding mass burial sites up in northern Iraq of Yazidis having been slaughtered. And we're, have you seen the stories of the women who were, were basically raped and held as sex slaves by these people? This was seen by Islamic State as religiously mandated. This is what God was telling you to do. And that's that's horrendous. That's an absolute aberration of anything that I know about Islam. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in Islam. I've read a lot about it over the past 35 years, but I, I'm not a Muslim personally. But it certainly is not consistent with what, what I know about Islam. And the same thing can be said about Buddhist extremists in Myanmar or Sri Lanka or mm-hmm. Thailand or Hindu extremists in India or Christian extremists around the world as well. It doesn't seem to matter what the, what the religion is. There are a very small number That'll take it to the nth degree and say that, you know what, I'm allowed to use violence against you because God tells me so. That's scary. Wow. Yeah. I, I remember seeing some, I think it was like movies and they would, they would have a, an American soldier going to Iraq or, or uh, uh, other places. And on the helmet, it said, God is with me. And then you think of the people on the other side, they're fighting, whoever it is, ISIS, they would have the same thing inscribed in, in their helmet. So, and then of course we remember World War II where you'd have, uh, both sides and they, they would have it on their helmets, God's with our side. So it seems, it seems kind of, uh, ridiculous there. If, if God is on both sides, then why are they even fighting? Well, they used to say that, you know, there's no atheists in foxholes, right? Uh, people seem to find religion when they're in positions of danger. But there's actually a really good book, and, I, and I'll have to uh, get you the reference later, by a Canadian, I believe it's a Canadian, who wrote about World War One and how religions, in this case Catholicism and Protestantism, were used by both sides in World War One. So on the sort of the French slash Belgian slash UK and by extension Canada side, and then by the German side, how uh, pastors and priests on both sides would invoke God for why their army was right and the other army was wrong. And these are two these are two very close sects of Christianity who were being told by their leaders that God's on our side, but He's not against He's not on the other side. And look at the you know look at the religious wars of the 14th, 15th, 16th century. I mean you know history is replete with examples of, of armies and leaders who use religion to justify going to war. So you're absolutely right. Um, that's different than than using religion to give you solace and strength in a time of need and a time of great danger. You know, as I said, if you're going to war and, and your religion helps you deal with that, that's that's okay. Mm-hmm. But if your religion says, oh, by the way, the other guy is an atheist, or the other guy is a kafir, or the other guy is a non-believer, and the other guy doesn't have God on his side, well, that becomes a lot more problematic. Right. I'd just like to inject here. I was thinking about the Marx, Karl Marx quote where, that everybody kind of says they say that religion's the opium of the people but if you look at that quote you'll find out that he was talking about people who are maybe poor they're under a dictatorship and they're just they're just trying to survive every day and they find comfort in their religion in that suffering so when he said opium we could probably interchange it with say painkiller or whatever sleeping pill it's something that people use to just get through the day. It's their coping mechanism. So it's not necessarily that it's, you know, making people high and they're, you know, for, well, yeah, it could be, but well, and, making and, and, people and, high and going, getting away from reality. Yeah. Right? And I think too, he probably was, I mean, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a Marxist scholar, but he was probably also suggesting that states use religion to keep people down, right? States use state religions to get people to go to mass or go to services. And that serves as, I note that for them that they will, so they can ignore the inequalities and the unfairness of the system itself and not fight fight back. So if we give them a little bit of religion, that should be enough for them to be okay and they won't rise up and try to overthrow us and, and, and take us out of office kind of thing. So I think that's probably what Marx meant in the end. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think, is was it the book 1984 or was it Brave New World? Well, there was these uh, 
happy pills that the government gave people, like blue little pills, just to help everybody to cope with whatever's happening. So, anyway, exactly. And in fact, there there is a great scene from, and I'm trying to think what the movie is, um, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, the original right, okay. film from the 1960s or 70s. I still have a copy of it downstairs. And there's mm-hmm. a scene basically where yeah, people are given this equivalent of an opiate to sort of you know keep them interested in society and this is a very brutal dictatorial society and and it, the government's just passing out this i think it was a television show or something that they were doing to get people to essentially you know just kind of take it easy and, and not be critical of the government and you know it happens all the time right and 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 you know dictatorial governments are always seeking ways either very brutally to repress any kind of freedom of thought or give the people something that just keeps them happy for a while so they won't rise up in the streets Right. Bread and circuses, some people say. Absolutely. Yeah. And now going back to you, we're talking about this uh, idea about divine punishment to fall on the wicked. And um, for example, I know a lot of some religions, they will say, OK, we're going to heaven. We're heaven bound. And those people out there, some people, they'll call it the world. The, anybody who's not us, they're they're going to hell. So maybe in this life. God will come and punish them early. Now, I saw on Twitter that uh, some people were hoping that President, U.S. President Donald Trump would get COVID-19, right? So that's kind of a publicly wicked um, confession people make. But um, that's that's one thing, thinking that, yeah, it, God and his sovereignty or whoever the deity is will just kind of do it for us. But You're taking it a step further when you say, well, you know, maybe God's not going to do it with the lightning bolt. He'll use me. I'm his instrument. I'm his tool. So I can be the one who inflicts that wrath on unbelievers. Yeah, and that that, that is scary. You know, there's this old saying, Vin, that uh, God helps those who who help themselves. And there's a a joke I heard years ago. Not really a joke, more of a a story. And it's about a guy who is uh, in a flood area and is in his house and... um, he, the floodwaters are rising, and a, a boat comes by, and they say, you know, jump in, jump in, uh, you know, save yourself. Guy says, nope, God's going to save me. And so the boat says, fine, it goes away, and then the water keeps rising. He's on his second floor, and another boat comes by, and he says, come on, this is your last chance. Jump in. Nope, God's going to, I believe in God, God's going to save me. So the boat says, fine, it goes away. And then finally, he's on his roof. The, the, the water's up to his, his, his neck. And a helicopter flies by and drops a ladder and says, you've got to take this, this, this ladder now or else you're going to drown. Guy says, nope, God's going to help me. So the helicopter flies off and sure enough, the, the guy drowns <laughs> and uh, he ends up in heaven and he gets to, to heaven and he says, he says, God, he said, where were you? I, I believed in you my whole life. I've, I've, t- I've tried to live my life according to your plan. And when I needed you most, you weren't there for me. And, and God says, I wasn't there for you. I sent two boats in a helicopter. What the hell else do you want? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that joke. It's still funny. It's still funny. Now, just um, looking at this, um, in Western countries, for example, it, it appears, of course, Christianity is the most uh, popular religion that it came from Europe. And as the uh, European countries were colonizing around the world, they brought Christianity. And then now, it seems like I read a lot of stories. They said, oh, um, you know, the Christian religion is dying because young people, as soon as they hit 18, they get out of their parents' house. They're defecting. They're becoming agnostics, atheists or getting into whatever uh, they call it mixed salad religion, where they'll just kind of believe whatever and they don't follow any particular religion. But it seems there's been a resurgence lately, especially when, uh, say, Christian or or we could maybe say Catholicism or evangelical strains of Christianity, it gets associated with politics. And I think we saw in Canada before with um, the conservatives and Stephen Harper that there was a little bit of religion mixed in there. A lot, Maybe we could say the religious wing of the conservative party. And then in the U.S., we could, of course, see it with the Republican Party. There's there's a lot of, uh, say, Catholics or evangelicals who may support the party because it aligns with their their thinking. So, and then of course people may go too far, like say in some of the new populist leaders worldwide. Like uh, 
I, I don't want to quote all the names, but say in Brazil or, uh, of course, with Trump. And uh, there has been a lot of these populist leaders. And uh, then we have like the far right who may not actually take religion seriously, but they're, they're using it as part of their their uh, skill set or their weaponry. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I do think there is a distinction to be made. You, you, I mean, I haven't seen the polling numbers, but you were right over the past few decades, there's been a decrease in the number of Canadians who would say that they are religious or deeply religious. And I think once one poll I saw stated that upwards of about a fifth, what well, 20% of Canadians would self-describe themselves as either athe- atheist or agnostic, which certainly is mm-hmm. very different than when I was growing up in the 1960s right. in, in southwestern Ontario. I, I think in the States, you've got a much higher percentage of those who would claim that they are religious, usually Christian, Christian, uh, some of whom fundamentalists or evangelical Christians. And, but I, I do think that at least so far, and of course this could change, um, that kind of strategy from a political perspective didn't work very well in Canada. Look at the last election, whereby mm-hmm. we had people who tried to play that religious card and they failed miserably. Uh, mm-hmm, the People's right. Party, the People's Party of Canada would be a prime example, right? They tried to, to use that as one of their platforms and didn't win a, a single seat by by large, you know, vote differences. Didn't get close to winning a seat here in Canada. And I think when when the Conservative Party under Stephen Harper tried to push that sort of religious envelope, a lot of Canadians recoiled, saying, "You know what? I got nothing to, no problems with religion. Don't use it in politics. Don't don't force it on me." And I'm thinking especially, you remember the Barbaric Practices Act that came out about, you know, how the you know, women shouldn't wear the niqab and it's, this is a, we're going to make it illegal for women to cover, cover their faces. Right. What was, okay. What, what was mm-hmm. Canadians reaction to that? It wasn't, it wasn't very positive. Sure. There are pockets here and there who are okay with it, but um, there's actually an, an MP or an MPP. I'm not sure which, which one he is um, who represents the riding where, where my wife was, is from, which is the Niagara Peninsula. And he's extremely evangelical, and I don't think he's a very popular guy with most of his constituents. Now, there is an evangelical population, and that's true, but I think for most Canadians, and I'm going to be careful here, because again, I'm not a religious scholar, I think mm-hmm. most Canadians would say, you know what, I've got no problems with, with you having your religion, keep it in your home. Don't try and use it in your policies, don't try and dictate to me and the rest of the people of Canada your version of religion. So we're, we know we're in a multicultural and multi-ethnic country here yes we're, we're still primarily christian writ large we have mm-hmm. large muslim population we have a jewish population we have a large sikh population we have a large buddhist population and i think canadians would be very aghast at, at any political party seeking to go back to i don't know the 15th century 16th century where christianity was you know the um the state religion the, the old adage and you know european that you know the religion of the rulers religion of the state I don't think anybody wants to go back to those days. I think Canadians would reject that categorically. Right. But now in the USA, we could we could see, like, um, going back to the idea of apocalypticism, I, I think that in religion, that's actually a really key feature. And I know in some strains of evangelical Christianity, they predict that uh, one day there'll be a one-world government. It will be ruled by uh, a European who revives the ancient Roman Empire, and it's uh, the code name is the Antichrist. I remember I was a kid. There was like Damon the Omen. There's a few movies mm-hmm. about it, and then uh, the Christians had a uh, the evangelical Christians had a book series that was very popular called Left Behind, and so uh, and some of them think there's this rapture where all the believers will fly up into space to to meet Jesus before this. Uh, there's supposed to be a seven year tribulation or it, it may come after. And there's a lot of debate about the, the, the scheduling, the order of things. But, uh, this, this, this sort of end times thinking, apocalyptic thinking, I think I've heard that, uh, for example, Vice President Mike Pence and then, uh, uh, Pompeo, he is the Secretary of State there. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and so this, this is actually motivating their policy toward Israel, for example, because they said, well, uh, say in the book of, I forget, it's Ezekiel or uh, Isaiah, one of the books of the Old Testament talks about Israel after many, many years will finally 
become a nation again. So that's a miracle from God. And so we need to support Israel no matter what the government there does. We just support them, even though, ironically, they're not evangelical Christian. But we'll still support them anyways against whoever. And then there are a lot of other sort of apocalyptic end times ideas that may uh, affect politics that comes through religion. Oh, sorry, one more thing. The attitude toward the United Nations. I've seen a lot of people who uh, who poo-poo the United Nations because they think, oh, that's the precursor of the one world government <laughs> based out of the revived Roman Empire in Europe. So I'm thinking, yeah, I don't mind people making up uh, all kinds of uh, storylines for the future. But once you bring it into our national or international politics, then it just starts affecting me and everybody else. So. Well, you've got to be really careful with, with you know basing 21st century policies on a book that was written over 2,000 years ago, divinely inspired or whatever. That's a very dangerous road to go down. And you know, the interesting part to me, Vin, about the evangelical Christians of the Lord of Israel is you know people don't really realize that, yeah, okay, they support Israel, and they, certainly they support Israel against the Palestinians and, and the other neighbors. And let's face it, Israel... It has been faced with, with you know, existential wars throughout its history. I'm not saying that everything Israel says and does is correct, but you got to acknowledge that they have been you know, put in danger. But in the evangelical Christian way of looking at things, Israel has to be destroyed. <laughs> you know, the Jews have to come to Jesus before the end of the world. And you, you mentioned the word apocalypse in your very, very first comments today. So, yeah, they support Israel, but they also support ultimately the destruction of Israel and the end of Judaism. So is that really support for Israel? Uh, I'd, I'd be really careful with that. Yeah, I think it's a real two-edged sword because you're supporting people who are actually not part of your group, and then you're hoping one day they'll convert, and uh, they may not convert. So uh, just uh, taking this uh, line of thought a little bit further, now I know there's some far-right or white supremacist uh, groups who actually – take in some elements of Christianity. Now, I really don't know how serious they are. They might be just, it might be window dressing. Uh, for example, there was the fellow in Norway who went to that small island and slaughtered a bunch of children uh, who were uh, the the kids of the ruling party there in Norway. And he was trying to say, oh, yes, I'm doing this. And he would quote maybe the Bible. But if, if you look at the background of that fellow, it looks like he really, he's just using Christianity at the last moment maybe to win some fans worldwide. But he's just kind of using it. I, I don't know. How, how serious is the connection between Christianity and, say, far right or white supremacism? I think it depends. I, I think there certainly are people. And if you, yeah, you're referring to Anders Breivik in 2011. I have his manifesto. It's 1,500 pages. It, it is a extreme stream of consciousness. Most of his, most of the stuff that he pulled out of his last minute. Uh, was he a Christian terrorist? I don't think I would go down that pathway. He had Brendan Tarrant in, in New Zealand a year ago who attacked a mosque. He also had some re religious references in his manifesto, of 85-page manifesto. I don't think these people are serious about framing this as a religious struggle. Others might disagree with me, but these are these aren't aren't well thought out arguments. These are people who are just hateful people who have embraced a hateful ideology and want to kill people, and they're just they're they're peppering their statements with religion. I don't know. Do they think they're going to attract people who are religious? Do they think that they're going to somehow come across as being uh, better people or justify justifying their actions through religion? So again, yeah, there are definitely are people that I think in, in, in the far right, and that's a very broad term that we use, the far right movement, who may in fact be also what I would call a Christian extremist. And I actually do have some examples in my book when religions kill, but I don't see this as primarily a religiously inspired form of violence in the same way that Islamist extremism is and Jewish extremism is and Buddhist extremism is and Hindu extremism is. So I, I would I wouldn't go down that pathway and say there's a very close relationship between aberrant, non-normative, extreme Christianity and most people that, that belong to the far right. But I'd also defer to people who study the far right a lot more than I do. But my, my initial impressions are no, this you would not construe this as a religious form of terrorism. You would construe it as an ideological form of terrorism. Right. Now, switching over to Islam, I... Uh... I think it was a couple of years ago, I was listening in my car to an audio book about the uh, roots of ISIS. And uh, I can't even remember, was it al-Baghdadi or there was another fellow uh, in Iraq? And 
it was talking about the formation of ISIS, and it seemed that that in the beginning there was some teachings going out about this whole apocalyptic, uh, the end times, the end of the world is nigh, and we really have to get out there and slaughter unbelievers. And I, I wonder if you could just uh, talk a little bit about their sort of end times, apocalyptic fervor that may have come out of ISIS there. Sure. In fact, I would simply refer your your readers or your listeners rather to my my first book, uh, The Threat from Within, recognize that Al-Qaeda inspired radicalization and terrorism in the West from 2015, put up by Roman and Littlefield. And in my 12 indicators of what I call Al-Qaeda inspired radicalization and violence, there is a uh, number 12 is an obsession with the end times. There, you look at ISIS and a whole bunch of other groups, and there's no question that in the narrative that they talk about, uh, the world's coming to an end. And there's all these incredibly interesting historic figures. There's this guy called the Mahdi, who is going to show up at the end of time, and right. and, and and surprisingly, he's going to he's going to fight alongside Jesus because Jesus is a prophet in Islam, much as he's a prophet in Christianity, and they're going to fight the battle to end all battles. And and Dabiq, the magazine that, that ISIS put out, talks about this all the time that we are living in the end times, and you know um, we are going to triumph because we are the righteous and God is on our side. And and there's a whole litany of narratives and stories and imagery and symbols that ISIS uses. And, and it's almost like the, the, the declaration of the, the so-called caliphate in 2014 by al-Baghdadi was kind of the precursor. We're going to establish the caliphate. People are going to hate us because we did that. They're going to attack us. But that's a sign that the end is coming. And it just recently been, I, I, I got some fascinating news that I read out of Indonesia that a lot of ISIS-inspired terrorists in that country are hoping to get COVID-19 and die from it. Because then they become oh, martyrs. Right. They become <laughs> martyrs in the same way that suicide bombers become martyrs and go to heaven and get all the rewards that, that we all know about, right? So there is an incredible uh, importance to many Islamist extremists with what we call Armageddon. Um, they call it Um, um al Maradak, sort of the, the mother of all battles. And they think that this is truly going to be the end of the world and an ushering in of an era in which their version of religion, their version of Islam, reign supreme. All other religions have disappeared because God has come down and he has fought with us and he has smitten you with his sword and we're going to be on the winning side. So yeah, apocalyptic scenarios uh, are huge for some of these guys. And again, I go into uh, more detail. There's actually a really a, another really good book uh, put out by a, a scholar. I just have it here in my bookshop. Just give me one second. Okay. It's a book entitled um, Holiest Wars. It's by Timothy Furnish, F-U-R-N-I-S-H. And it's, it says Islamic Mahdi's, their jihads, and Osama bin Laden. And it dates from, let's see now, 2005. I, I, I got this book when I was still working at CSIS, and it's a whole chapter on who the Mahdi was and what he means. Really good book. And those who are interested in the, the role of the apocalypse in terrorist groups should, uh, should check that book out. Okay. You know, honestly... I have a lot of more questions, and I think we're, we're, we're going to be maybe one day have to do a part two. But I just want to fast forward here to the question of now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good. Maybe we can say mostly good in religion and people around us with various religions. And of course, you've talked about the dark side. Now, I'm just wondering, so with all this knowledge that we have, how, how can we, we work with people of various religions around us. And then, of course, maybe we can, I don't know, assist or come alongside them to, to make sure that they don't have elements within to that could kind of go down the dark path. Well, I, I think we point to commonalities. I mean, on the surface, there are many differences in the way we worship and the particular gods we worship and the rules. Lots of churches have lots of rules. Religions have lots of rules. But I think if we strip away all the veneer and get down to the basics, which I, I kind of, you know, I started off with, most people are good people. Most people want to do good things. Most religions want to do good things. And this is why you have outreach programs between Muslims and Christians and Jews. We, I see it here in Ottawa all the time, right? And I think that by working together, we can, we can stress the commonality. So, you know, in particular, Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam are all based on the same prophetic tradition. Right. Right. The, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in, in Islam, these are, these are called Ahl Kitab, people of the book. What book? The same scripture that gave us the Old Testament and then later gave us the New Testament and then gave us the Quran. You read the Quran, you, you read the same stories that I read when I was a kid. The same mm -hmm. prophets are in the Quran as are in the Old Testament, New Testament. So I think if we stress those types of things, we, we can hopefully um, be stronger and then 
denounce when our faiths are being used to promote bad, to promote uh, violence, and uh, and simply work together by by agreeing that you know what we're all on the same side here. We're, we're not we're not out to kill each other. We're not exactly. out to annihilate each other. We're all on the same side. So let's work together to identify those few actors. And let's be really honest here, Vin. Very, very few people go down this pathway of violent radicalization and terrorism. It really is a, it's a rounding error in most countries. Yeah, people think it's much greater than it is. It is not. But let's stop saying, you know, Islam is a religion of terrorism or Judaism is a religion of terrorism. It's not. Are there interpretations used to, to justify terrorism? Absolutely. This is why you, when I, I get upset when people say, you know, there's nothing about Islam and Islamist extremism. I said, are you kidding me? Look at, look at any statement by any terrorist group that happens to be Islamist extremist. You can't get two sentences into a statement without a verse from the Quran or a verse from the Hadith saying it's the Prophet Muhammad. I'm not saying it's normative. I'm not saying it's, it's mainstream, but it certainly is taking from the religious tradition, but it's, it's an aberration, right? It's a, it's an extension. It's a, it's a, it's a misinterpretation. So I think that as societies, if we, if we just recognize that there's much more that, that unites us than divides us, I think we'd be much better off. And I do agree with you, by the way. I think we do, we really need to set a time for a, for a second podcast to explore right. all these questions. Yeah, there's so much more to do. So what's one important message or idea that you'd like to leave with all the listeners today? So speaking as Canadians, I think we have to recognize that, that terrorism is a very, 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 very rare thing in our society. You know, I, I quiz people mm-hmm. when I teach a course at the University of Ottawa, how many Canadians have died in an act of terrorism since Confederation? Uh, and the answer is about 12, <laughs> depending on, Whoa. and if you, if you, if you expand the definition to include maybe the incels and other things, your answer is still under 30. So under 30 people have died in 153 years. What does that tell you? It doesn't happen a lot in this country. Not to say that we have, we don't, we, we, we still be vigilant. This is why we have CSIS and the RCMP on our side. And we have to, you know, work with those, with those organizations when we, when we have concerns. But terrorism is not, a, it's, you know, it's not, not, not is it not only a, not an existential threat, it's not mm-hmm. even a daily threat here in a country like Canada. Now, that's different if you're in Afghanistan or Somalia or Nigeria or Iraq or Syria. But let's not obsess about terrorism in a country where it occurs so infrequently as to be virtually non-existent. That's that's the most important message I want Canadians to take away. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Phil. I know you have to go to some other appointments and we'll probably have to reschedule a, a, another part two uh, later on if that's possible and thank you so much for uh, coming and uh, talking to everybody about this really touchy sensitive subject of religion and and bringing a real rational message about it thanks so much my pleasure it was it was was great to have a chat with you i look forward to our next time okay take care you too so my dear listeners that's the interview phil gursky really knows this stuff I myself learned so much from this interview. Thanks again to Phil for being a guest here at the Multi-Hazards Podcast. So here's a little disclaimer that I add to the end of each and every podcast. And it is, this podcast is meant to be educational and does not try to offer legal, medical, or other specific advice unless otherwise noted. Also, the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that the host, that's me, or guests are part of. So, here we are at the conclusion of this episode, and I'd like to thank all of you, each one of you, for listening. Stay safe out there, and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out.